Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Stack. I'm the Executive Director of the School of International and Public Affairs and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And it is a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to our special lecture by former US Secretary of State, Madeleine K. Albright. I have a number of uh, acknowledgments, first and foremost, to the Broad family for their huge generosity to Florida International University. Uh, they made this lecture possible, and the wonderful Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series uh, in uh, the College of Arts and Sciences. It is our lead lecture series, and it allows us to bring extraordinary speakers. So uh, Anita, Morris, uh, Anne, John, Laura, our gratitude for all you've done, including the magnificent auditorium in the SIPA building. I'd like to acknowledge Trustee Michael Adler, uh, Foundation Board Member David Adler, uh, uh, the President's Council Board Member Victor Ballesta, uh, from the SIPA Board, J.C. Flores, and Ed Glab. Welcome. We are delighted to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the fifth president of Florida International University, Dr. Mark B. Rosenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here at, at our FIU. Before we begin, I would like to ask for a moment of silence in memory and in honor of U.S. Ambassador Christopher Stevens and his team who tragically perished in Libya. Thank you. Today is a perfect intersection of three forces. Vaclav Havel, an individual with boundless optimism and hope, a symbol to so many of us of the Velvet Revolution. We will always be grateful for his timeless essay, an essay that indeed we teach right here at our School of International and Public Affairs, called The Power of the Powerless, which was written in October of 1978 and distributed. It moved millions, millions, to reject the trivialization that they were subject to by tyrants and dictatorial governments. We will always be grateful for his presence here at FIU, one of his last stops as president, when he provided comfort by assuring us in 1996 that our families and neighbors would soon be reunited in a free Cuba. And at that gathering, some of you who are here today may recall, if you were there then, and I think there are, at that gathering, a message was read from Osvaldo Paya. Mr. Paya had just led an effort to collect signatures on a referendum on democratic reforms for Cuba. And in that message, Mr. Paya praised Havel's courage. Of course, many of you know that Mr. Paya tragically died under very mysterious and suspicious circumstances, or worse, just a few weeks ago. So the first force is President Havel. The second force is Madeleine Albright, the first woman in the United States ever to serve as Secretary of State. And we will always be grateful 
for Madeleine Albright's courage and for serving as a beacon to us in South Florida, where so many are victims of tyranny and oppression, as was her family during and after World War II. And as you can see from the picture, it was in 1996 as well. We knew what was going to happen, that Madeleine Albright was awarded an honorary doctorate degree by our faculty right here in this room at FIU, and we're very proud of that. And, and, then of course, and then, of course, there is the third force in this intersection, the third force, and that is our FIU, which is a university that's not yet 50, year, 50 years old, that finds a way to turn the impossible into the inevitable, time after time, in service to this incredible community. And we're going to always be grateful to this institution because it too serves as a beacon of hope and opportunity for our New World community to realize its American dream. And indeed, yes, it is one day our hope, and hopefully some of you can help us with this, to turn the impossible into the inevitable with the Vaclav Havel Center for Human Rights and Diplomacy. That is our dream as a consequence of this intersection. So, so clearly today, clearly today at the intersection, at, this, at the center of this intersection is our commemoration of an earlier visit by President Havel and an earlier visit by, Pre by, by Secretary Albright. And indeed, through the presence of Secretary Albright, we are going to commemorate the, the presence of the visionary Vaclav Havel. Madeleine Albright was born in the Czech Republic. She made history, as you well know, in 1997, when she became the first woman to, to the, named to the post of US Secretary of State. At that point, she was the highest ranking woman in the history of the US government. And as Secretary of State, she reinforced our alliances, advocated democracy and human rights, promoted American trade, business, and labor, and environmental standards and, uh, abroad. Prior to that time, from 93 to 97, she had served as US permanent representative to the United Nations, and of course, in that capacity, served as a member of the president's cabinet. She has a long and distinguished career in public service. She's a professor of practice in diplomacy at Georgetown, the Georgetown University School of, of Foreign Service. She currently serves as the chair of a global strategy group, Albright Stone Bridge, Bridge Group. And among her many achievements, aside from receiving an honorary degree from our FIU, <laughs> is that she is a, a presidential recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, ladies and gentlemen, which is the nation's highest civilian honor. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Madeleine Albright. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Rosenberg and Dr. Stack, Ambassador Gundlovich, and distinguished panelists, guests, and members of Florida International University community. I consider myself a proud member of that community. Having an honorary degree puts me right with you here. So thank you very, very much, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I am delighted to be here and to see so many friends, including Ambassador Martin Palos. Now, I met the ambassador long ago, before he acquired that title, and this was more than 25 years ago during the Cold War, when Martin was a leading anti-communist dissident in Czechoslovakia. And I was in the country on a trip sponsored by the United States Information Agency, and the two of us were compelled to meet in secret because the government assumed that any American visitor was, had to be a spy. In fact, that wasn't far off. I, I was no uh, James Bond, not even a James Bond girl, but I would have done whatever I could uh, 
to help Martin and other democratic leaders overthrow the communist government. Three years later, in the Velvet Revolution, that's exactly what they did. And as a result, one of Martin's colleagues, a charismatic playwright named Václav Havel, became president. Havel proved a remarkable national leader, and in 2003, he traveled here to Florida International to deliver a speech, and I know that some of you were present, you've just talked about it, and uh, a lot of discussion followed. But even with this history, others among you may be wondering what real connection could possibly exist between a university in Florida and a Czech political figure who died this past December. After all, an ocean separates this campus from Europe, and almost a decade has passed since President Havel's visit, and there are barriers of language and generation and culture to deal with as well. My answer begins with the fact that Václav Havel's approach to life was very much that of a student, and this never changed. He loved lively music, especially rock and roll and jazz, and he felt most at home in jeans and a well-worn jacket. Like many students, he had both an inquisitive mind and a visceral distaste for pretension and hypocrisy. And he never stopped believing that with a little effort and a healthy slice of courage, we could make the world a better place. Even though he was very much a product of Czech culture and history, Havel's identity transcended the narrow boundaries of nationalism. He was a Czech patriot, but his primary loyalty was to truth, and that makes him relevant to every time and every place. And to illustrate what I mean, let me share a story. Not long after he became president, uh, Havel traveled to Washington, where he was scheduled to deliver an address to a joint session of Congress. But the first thing he wanted to do was to meet with students. He said, it's the students who brought the Velvet Revolution, and I want to go meet with the students. So I did use my Georgetown connection, and he did, in fact, go to meet with students. Uh, I had the honor of helping him to prepare for his um, uh, congressional appearance, and he arrived in the United States with his speech handwritten on yellow paper. I hadn't seen too many presidents who actually wrote the whole speech out themselves. And he asked me and Rita Klimova, who was the then Czechoslovak ambassador to the United States, to translate it. And also, we knew, because he'd had little experience in public speaking and had developed a very bad habit in prison of avoiding eye contact, uh, that he needed a coach in order to speak to our members of Congress. So we had translated the speech, and we were there with him and this coach as he was rehearsing at Blair House, and he looked at this, and it was all you know, translated in English. He said, this is not my word. I would never use this word. Uh, and he said, I'm not going to give this speech in English. And so after all that, he um, get, got, gets up there before 535 members of Congress and began to speak in Czech. Uh, his delivery was terrible, but it didn't matter. Havel may not have been the smoothest of orators, but he was authentic and also really, really surprising. The world had expected him to denounce the Soviet leaders who had long oppressed his country. Instead, he requested help for the Russian people in making their own transition to democracy. Instead of treating the Cold War's end as a climactic victory, he emphasized the challenge that lay ahead to create a world shaped by moral responsibility. Instead of focusing on ideology or politics, he stressed the obligations we each have to one another. Narrow interests of all kinds, insisted Havel, must give away to universal principles and concerns. It was a very idealistic speech, not the sort that most national leaders would give, but Havel had no interest in the kind of political rhetoric that divides people into one camp or another, or that exploits anger, resentment, and fear. He had affection neither for the trappings of high office nor for the wielding of power as a means to reward friends and punish foes. He spent little time talking about his own accomplishments. Instead, he was an educator and an advocate who understood that real leadership comes from bringing out the best in others. 
And one way he did that was by expressing solidarity with men and women around the world who were taking risks for freedom. Whether the specific challenge was posed by apartheid in South Africa or ethnic cleansing as in the Balkans or genocide as in Rwanda and Sudan or political repression on any continent, Václav Havel never hesitated to raise his voice on behalf of justice. Among those who could count on him as an ally were the people of Cuba, including a man whose name should be familiar to many of you, Oswaldo Paya. For almost a quarter of a century, Mr. Paya was a leader in Cuba's pro-democracy movement, a struggle fiercely opposed by the Castro regime. Controlled by all the weapons of totalitarianism, Paya responded bravely and with faith. And year after year, he sought to expose the Cuban government's hypocrisy and gradually increase popular pressure for democratic change. In 2007 in Prague, I attended an event sponsored by an organization known as Forum 2000. This was an effort launched by President Havel to promote peaceful solutions to global problems and also to give hope to people who desire freedom but who live in societies that are not free. Havel invited Mr. Paya to come to the Czech Republic to speak, but the authorities in Havana denied him permission to travel. No big surprise. Paya nevertheless wrote a statement that he asked me to read on his behalf, and in it he made four fundamental points. First, he expressed the yearning of the Cuban people for freedom. This included the right to speak openly and without fear, to organize and vote in democratic elections, to own businesses and travel, and to be treated fairly under the law. Second, he endorsed the idea of a transition period provided it would lead to genuine liberty, but he cautioned against the kind of counterfeit reform that would enable the communists to go from being the country's only party to being its only capitalists, or that would embrace economic change without political freedom. Third, he stressed his intention to follow a nonviolent path in keeping with the Cuban population's wish to preserve lives, dignity, and safety. Finally, he emphasized his affection and respect for Cubans who have emigrated and also the hope that they would support the aspirations of their friends and loved ones back home. As we're all aware, two months ago, Oswaldo Paya's voice was stilled forever, the result of an automobile crash that took place under suspicious circumstances, but that was nevertheless labeled an accident. In the grim light of that tragedy, friends of Cuba must remain firm. It is up to us to ensure that Paya's message continues to be heard louder and more clearly than ever before. Just as the lessons that Václav Havel sought to teach will long outlive him, so Oswaldo Paya's advocacy of justice and freedom must remain a clarion call inside Cuba and around the world. There can only be one fitting epitaph for Oswaldo Paya and for the thousands of his countrymen who have, over the years, given their lives in support of democracy. And that epitaph is, in fact, a declaration of renewal. Viva Cuba Libre. The people of Cuba have been forced to live for decades under dictatorship. They and the citizens of other countries who have had a comparable experience are often burdened by feelings of cynicism and despair. For them, liberty's promise may seem an illusion, a prize that remains beyond their grasp, even as one year gives way to the next. To them, I wish I had a more fully satisfactory answer. None of us have it within our power to guarantee the triumph of democracy. But we can have faith that the yearning for freedom is relentless and that the walls it cannot over overwhelm, it will nevertheless erode. We can look to the example of Václav Havel and Martin Palos, who helped bring liberty to their own country after more than 40 years of repression. We can point to Burmese opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who spent most of the last two decades under house arrest, but who is now an elected member of parliament. And we can draw inspiration from Oswaldo Paya himself, who endured setback after setback without ever abandoning his principles. 
We know that the transformation from tyranny to democracy does not come easily because nothing that matters ever does. We're all mortal, but the pursuit of freedom has no end. This past October, even though his health was deteriorating rapidly, President Havel signed a document known as the Budapest Appeal, which reminded every country in Europe of its obligation to observe democratic norms. His last public statements were in support of prisoners of conscience in Belarus and of opposition protests in Moscow, where on the day of his funeral, 80,000 demonstrators observed a moment of silence to mark his passing. I last saw Havel 11 months ago when I was among those who gathered in Prague to celebrate his 75th birthday. My gift to him at the time was a compass that had been used by American soldiers in World War I, the conflict that led to Czechoslovakia's founding. In my note, I cited the irony of giving a compass to someone who had served as the North Star for an entire generation. In one sense, Havel was very much a product of his place and time, but he thought, spoke, and acted on behalf of principles that will always matter everywhere. And that's why it's so appropriate that we are here today and why it's so exciting that a center is being planned for this great university that will carry on the work that President Havel so nobly advanced. And to that end, I congratulate you all for what you've done and will do in support of freedom, justice, and pursuit of truth. And I thank you also for your very kind attention this afternoon. And I now look forward to answering whatever questions you have. And since I'm no longer Secretary of State, I can actually answer your questions. <laughs> Dr. Albright, you are inspiring, and it's an honor to have you uh, at FIU. Uh, we will begin the question and answer period. Uh, I expect and hope that your questions will be brief so that I can encourage as much participation as I can from the audience. And we will be setting up microphones or setting them up uh, now. So let me begin with a question. Uh, Secretary Albright, and that is the, the most recent events in the Arab Spring over the last couple of nights. What should the American response be to this very difficult situation? Well, I know what it shouldn't be, but... Um, uh, oh, we can go there, too. <laughs> now, let me say the following thing, and to put uh, a lot of context on this. I think that we have misunderstood what has been going on in the Arab world, um, believing that it was something that would be relatively simple and happen quickly. Um, I was involved in a very interesting discussion um, this winter and with an Arab in, at Georgetown in front of a large audience. And I said, well, it's the winter, so we can't call it the Arab Spring anymore. So let's call it the Arab Awakening. And this Arab got really mad at me, and he said, that's such an insult to Arabs. We haven't been asleep all this time. And I said, so what would you call it? And he said, I'd call it Arab troubles. And I said, well, what about Arab opportunities? And so just in those four thoughts, sentences, I think it shows the complications of it all. We have talked about what has been going on in the Arab world as if it were monolithic. It's very different country to country. It clearly spread very rapidly as a result of the immolation of the young man in Tunisia. But in each of the countries, it is a little bit different and is a complex and, um, I think, a long-term problem. It was covered, I, it always takes me like two minutes to get to criticizing the media, but basically it was covered as if it were a spectator sport. And I hesitate using sports analogies, but even one that doesn't even have overtime. So the bottom line is it's more a marathon and, and a very complex one. 
Um, there are a number of different groups in all these countries, and but where they are similar is that there is a very large youth bulge population, uh, many young men, many of whom are unemployed uh, and are available for demonstrations and various problems. So I think that is a context. In, in Egypt, uh, we have seen a free election. Um, may have not provided the answer that everybody wanted, but they, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and it was certified as a free and fair election. Um, in um, Libya, a different situation where as a result of NATO intervention, uh, Gaddafi, who promised to murder his people, actually was uh, taking care of himself. So, but there was no in structure. The bottom line is, is what happened was a huge tragedy and organized, I think, by a variety of groups. And um, I read an article today by one of my friends, Bruce Rydell, who was in the government at a certain period, and he said that we can't fall into the trap of being a part of what Al-Qaeda wanted, which is to disrupt. They did not do well in the Arab awakening, and they are trying to catch up. And we cannot uh, be entrapped in terms of denouncing what is happening in these countries as the result of the viciousness of a, of a mob. Uh, I think people are worried about this, but our reaction should be great sorrow um, at the death of Americans. And thank you for pointing out Ambassador Stevens, uh, who is really a remarkable uh, diplomat. But also, I think we need to understand that we have to stay the course. We have to be supportive of the movements that are taking place there. Thank you, Dr. Albright. Let us begin with some Q&A. Uh, again, please, the microphones are here. Uh, I would ask that uh, you be brief so that we can encourage. Please just step up to the mics. Yes, sir. Uh, Secretary Albright, um, previously in one of my classes, one of my teachers actually compared the Arab, um, Arab Spring to the revolutions of 1989 and how there seems to be a domino effect um, in both of them. Can we actually look to the revolutions of 1989 for maybe like a course of where mm -hmm. the Arab Spring will actually go? Well, I, I think there's a great temptation to compare the two um, movements. I think that... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, what's happened in the Arab world is as significant a uh, watershed event as the revolutions of, of 89 were at the end of the Cold War. Uh, I think nothing will be the same in the Arab world as it wasn't in the former uh, communist countries. But I think there's some differences among them. And um, you'll be sorry you asked this question because I spend my whole life on it. But um, <laughs> basically what we found with the Central and East Europeans was that they mostly wanted to be Europeans. They wanted to be part of Europe. Uh, and they had been artificially divided from Europe. Um, there was a sense that they had been left behind. And there was a desire to adopt a variety of Western uh, um, thoughts and culture. I think that what is happening in the Arab world is different in that regard. I think that the history of um, Arab evolution has been different. Um, and I think that in many ways what we're seeing is a struggle within the Muslim world. So there is a desire to have a government of choice and it will be whatever it is they want. I think it's obviously a monumental event, but I think we're gonna have to look at it with different, I hate to disagree with your professor, um, but um, look at for a number of, of different kind of standards and things that are gonna go on. Things that are similar are the desire of people to have dignity, uh, to be a, have, make decisions about the way that they will live, uh, to be able to have some control over their lives. Uh, but I think some of the, the um, kind of overall cultural thoughts may be different, not necessarily dominated by the West, but by their own sense of where they belong within civilization and culture. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Zachary Ruiz. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, the other night, uh, former President Bill Clinton spoke at the Democratic National Convention, and essentially his speech was towards uh, presidential candidate Romney's campaign and how many of the points that they're running on aren't exactly truths. 
And I was wondering how you felt that that uh, affected the American perception globally, that we have someone who's running for president on this campaign is based on things that are not exactly all factual. Well, first of all, let, let me just say this. Um, uh, I have a, a take on this that, that may surprise you. I've been to many, many conventions. The first one actually was 72 here in Miami. But starting in 1984, as chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, we have hosted, which is something I didn't know, how many foreign visitors come to our conventions. And uh, so we decided that what we wanted to do was to, we, starting in 84, to do seminars to the people, the foreigners that come, to explain what it is they're seeing. So we had about 350 foreign visitors in, uh, in uh, Charlotte with us. And by the way, Charlotte really did an amazing job uh, of hosting everybody. And so I can tell you what they thought. Uh, first of all, we told them that an awful lot of things would happen, that uh, um, the media would disagree with what uh, each other, uh, that they would be looking for problems, any number of different things. So I think they are used to seeing um, Americans um, talk about their politics in, in a variety of different ways. Um, I do think, and I'm obviously prejudiced here, I, I've told people that when I was Secretary of State, I had all my partisan instincts surgically removed. They have all grown back, so. Uh, 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 so I believe that President Clinton, who's gotta be one of the world's greatest speakers, right? You all agree with that. Um, uh, is a truth teller. And he did it in such a way that uh, the other people are scrambling now to figure out what it is they actually said. And they've made a few mistakes since then. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dorsher. I'm Stephanie Dorsher. I'm the uh, Associate Director of the Office of Global Learning Initiatives here. And I'd just like to kind of piggyback on your question, Dr. Stack and also pose to you the same question that I was able to pose to um, Tom Friedman when he was here. I have a friend who, um, his name is Robert Becker, he managed the NDI office in Cairo and is currently standing trial. Uh, another friend, democratization consultant, um, killed in Afghanistan and now the ambassador to Libya. So the question is, what, how do you see the future of um, American boots on the ground uh, working for democracy uh, in the Arab world? Um, I, I see um, a very important role. And let me just say, and again, to go back a little bit on, on the story of how these institutes got started, one of the people that you're going to hear from at a later panel is Carl Gershman, who's president of the Endowment for Democracy, which is the umbrella organization. It may surprise people, but the whole concept began with Ronald Reagan. Uh, who in 1983 spoke in London at Westminster and talked about the fact that democracies were not very good at explaining themselves vis-a-vis -vis communism. And he came back and he started the National Endowment. It has four institutes under it, Democrats and Republicans, Business and Labor. Uh, I was the first vice chair of the National Democratic Institute. The truth is we did not have a clue what to do. Uh, American political parties are a little bit different from others. And so what we started to do was to look at other models. And the model we picked uh, to look at at the time were the German political parties that had foundations attached to them, Stiftungs, that went into countries to provide the nuts and bolts of democracy uh, in Spain and Portugal, for instance. So that is how we began. And we don't go to countries where we are not welcome. Um, and we have partners in the countries where we are. Um, and I think that we will have, we have an awful lot to do because there is a, um, a growth of those people in the world who want democracy, who not necessarily exactly American style democracy, but want to be able to make decisions about themselves how they run their lives. And so I think that it continues to be a growth industry. There is a big difference in imposing democracy, as we 
You can't militarize democracy, which is one reason that I did not support the war in Iraq. But we can uh, promote democracy and provide the tools of it. And I think that that kind of work will continue, uh, partially because um, it's important. And partially, if I might say, you mentioned mostly Americans. But what NDI has done is to decide that we're not the only ones that know how to do democracy. And NDI's first job was actually in Chile doing the No campaign. Uh, and so now we use a lot of people from other countries. We have Chileans who go with us, Czechs that, that go with us, Hungarians. Um, so that it's not just Americans going into these countries. And so I think it will continue. I hope it will, because ultimately, I do believe we are all the same, and people want to be able to live free lives. Yes, Good afternoon, Madam Albright. My name is Gabriela Morera. I'm a student here at FIU. Thank you for coming. My question will move, uh, I'm going to move geographically. I would like to know how you perceive uh, the expansion of undemocratic values across Latin America, specifically cases like Venezuela or Bolivia. Thank you. Um, I think, and one of the points that I have made an awful lot of is I'm sure that students of political science here and history all have these discussions. What comes first, political development or economic development? I, I, mean, I was in classes where all anybody, you try to figure out what comes first. They come together. They have to come together. And what I say is the reason that's true is because people want to vote and eat. And so um, there, and democracy has to deliver. And one of the issues, and specifically, I have talked about Venezuela a lot in this particular case. When we were in office, I went to Venezuela with President Clinton and a number of times by myself. And without being too insulting, what I found was that the country was run by a bunch of tired old men that have absolutely no relationship to the people. And I could understand where Hugo Chavez came from. Uh, he initially seemed to be a very charismatic leader. When President Clinton and I met with him at a UN General Assembly session, he was talking about the importance of setting up a poor people's fund and sharing the oil money and a variety of different aspects of having a little bit more division of the oil riches that Venezuela has. He clearly uh, was corrupted by power. But the bottom line is that democracy has to deliver. And when I was in office, what we did, it was interesting, because the democracy movement in many ways in Latin America began a lot with the help of President Carter and Alfonsine in Argentina. And I used to carry around a map that showed how democracy was moving across Latin America, where the authoritarian countries were in red and the democratic countries were in green. And when we were in office, there was only one little red island left. Um, and there really had, in fact, begun to move. But because I think that there was not enough distribution of wealth or recognition of the indigenous peoples who live in Latin America, that democracy was not delivering. And so then people are more attracted to some kind of a demagogue um, that promises things that he doesn't deliver. Yes, sir. Your Hi. name, please. Javier Alonso, a student here at FIU as well. My question for you, Secretary, is um, many times when you were Secretary of State and when you were serving as the ambassador to the UN, you saw firsthand uh, the ravages of genocide in Eastern Europe as well as the converse in Western Europe, the rapid integration of um, Western European powers. My question to you today is where do you see Europe as a whole, not just West and East, progressing as the European Union begins integrating more and more Eastern countries? Where do you see the major trends sort of converging, and where do you see Europe as a whole going over the next uh, 10 to 20 years long term, I guess? Thank you. I think that um, obviously the history of Europe is a very complicated one, where there were decades and whole centuries of people destroying each other for uh, who they were, not anything that they'd ever done. And um, what was very interesting, I'm a child of World War II, and um, the kind of you got the sense um, sometime during the 20th century that people were beginning to understand that something different had to be done. Certainly in Western Europe with the creation of 
um, the um, uh, economic community and the evolution of that. And then, as I said earlier, the joining of the other twin um, after the end of the Cold War. What I think has happened, and, and the Balkans were obviously the big example of a country that was held together by fear uh, and where people began to do ethnic cleansing and genocidal killing simply for who, who they were. There was nothing. And I think that we in the United States were waiting for Western Europe to actually do something about it, and they didn't, and so we got involved in it. What I'm troubled by now is the fact that there is some part of what's happening in Europe that is regressing. Uh, that there, and I, let me just say this, whenever I am in Europe, I always say to any European, I'm just like you, I was born here, I just happen to have been raised in America, so I can tell you what I really think about you, and you're a mess. Um, <laughs> because I think it's disappointing. I think it's very disappointing that kind of the idea that there was going to, they were going to get away from the horrors of the 20th century. But what we're seeing is with the economic problem, something that does happen, you have to find a scapegoat. And so they are beginning to blame each other and look for those that are responsible. I find some of the language that I've heard about how the Northerners feel about the Southern Europeans quite unacceptable. Uh, I also think that the attitude, I'm an immigrant here. And I feel very welcomed in the United States. I have ever since we got here. Uh, the Europeans are, are in some ways very nervous about the immigration of people that are coming in. So I am hoping that there will be kind of a, a wake up moment uh, where they will see that a Europe that is respectful of each other's peoples is much stronger than one where ethnic divisions begin again. And it varies from day to day. I mean, yesterday's vote by the German, it's the only word I know in German, Bundesverfassungsgericht, which is their administrative court, decided that uh, the, the whole banking system would actually work. Um, that is a step forward. Um, and so I think it's a day-to-day -day thing where certain forces see the value of a, of a Europe that is not divided, and then there are those who are looking for scapegoats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question, given our schedule. Go ahead. G give us your name. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike McCormick. I'm a student here at FIU. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you again for coming to speak to us today. Um, so in the last few minutes, you've talked a lot about democracy promotion. That's been a top priority for the United States government, especially in places like the Middle East over the past decade. Um, but every, as we've seen in countries like Iraq and in the Palestinian territories, more recently in Egypt, uh, the people have elected governments and elected leaders who, frankly, you could make the argument, um, aren't fair, or sorry, aren't, uh, don't serve American interests in the long term. And perhaps even as horrible as it is to say, those not so democratic governments served American interest in the long term, some would argue. Uh, what would be your response to that conundrum we're currently facing in those sort of places? Well, I have always believed that ultimately the United States is more secure surrounded by democracies because uh, it is, they are systems that ultimately correct themselves that provide possibilities for their people to prosper. There's no question, that, that is my theory. What does happen is sometimes the wrong people get elected. It happens here. Um, and so um, the thing that is important is to realize that there has to be a second election. Uh, there, and that what really happens is that the accountability, what is interesting, about, when we started NDI, we were there talking about what were the really the essential elements of democracy. Some of these said elections. Well, elections are necessary but not sufficient. Um, there has to be rule of law, but there also, and we said this flat out, there has to be an opposition party, a loyal opposition that in fact provides accountability and choice. And so in the long run, I think we are safer when uh, we are surrounded, when the world is filled with democracies, but it is a little rock and roll at times. I think that having, um, this is a part that is always very difficult to say, especially to young people, is that foreign policy is not necessarily totally consistent. Uh, you have a large value system about what you believe in, human rights, freedom of speech, et cetera. 
Uh, but there are various times where you have to make a pragmatic choice. And we have seen that in a number of places. Um, and that is sometimes why you end up with um, allies or uh, partners that are not necessarily ones that you would choose forever. But the bottom line is the long-term national interest of the United States, I believe, is to promote, promote, not impose democratic governments. Secretary Albright. <clears throat> In my 35 years at FIU, this is one of the finest presentations we, we've ever had. Thank you for your grace, your wisdom, and most of all, your optimism. We're honored to have you.